Um, let me see if I can clean my lens real quick. These things are a little blurry at the moment. So here's my demonstration for how I recommend starting assignment three, which is all about warm and cool um, colors, like I mentioned in class. So your palette should be burnt sienna, titanium white, and ultramarine blue. Um, and I just sort of clipped my values, uh, value scale here just so I can get a better understanding of how dark and how bright my colors are, are actually looking. And this is going to be good for us also to start finding value in um, saturated colors. So, so far we've talked about value in neutral or achromatic colors. And moving forward, we're going to keep talking about value in our paintings, but this time we're going to refer to value um, within the inherent value of our color mixes that have different colors. So anyway, different hues. So make sure that you have this handy as well. Um, and I also mentioned during class that I'm painting, I, I'm choosing to paint my closet here. I made a few other sketches before I decided to go with this one, which I cut out so I can just tape it up here as my reference. Um, a few other ones I did were of like the floor. This is the same closet over here in the corner of my room with boxes in the in the closet and then sort of the directional lines of the floorboards and the baseboards. Um, and these are all five minute or seven minute sketches again with graphite. This is the doorway into this room, um, looking out into the hallway, kind of a low cropped view of the hallway and the living room over here. And then this one is the doorway to get into the room with light coming through um, and casting this really nice shadow from the doorway on the floor. Um, the issue I'm gonna face, uh, or I would have faced more if I chose one of these three was that there was a little bit more natural light affecting the shadows and the shapes in all of these three thumbnails. Um, and since I'm doing my demonstration at night, I chose to go with the closet one because the light changed over here the least um, when compared to these parts of the room. So when you pick your space, make sure that you're aware of which one um, is going to change the least in terms of the light source. So let me go ahead and tape this back up here. And um, when you're taking notes with your thumbnails, a couple things to jot down that I think are helpful are pointing out where your darkest values are and your brightest values are, and then also starting to think about where you want your cooler colors to be and your warmer colors to be. And if you don't know where to start with that, I would recommend, um, let me zoom in here for you. I would recommend your brighter values being the warmer parts of your painting and the darker values being the cooler, at least to visualize it from the beginning. Um, you can change that as you paint, but this is just a good general rule to think about how temperature is going to impact space. So in general, we, th we refer to cooler colors as being colors that recede in space or give the illusion that they are further away from us, whereas warmer colors have the um, impact or effect of feeling closer to us. So that's another way that you could orient your thumbnail in terms of color is to think about, well, what's closest to me in this space that I'm looking at? And for me, that would probably be this baseboard and this wall. So this will probably be where I have more of my warmer tones in my painting. Compositionally, I do want to mention that I was much more interested in this lower view of my room and um, this doorway view. But given the situation of my studio and, and how my easel is set up, and it's a very, it's a small space, it just wouldn't have been very feasible um, for me to make a demonstrated painting uh, with those views. So instead, I'm choosing to go with this closet space. Um, and I'm trying to give us the best view possible, while also not cramping my painting space um, too much. So let's see if I can just make a couple adjustments here. It would be nice if I had the ability to zoom out, but I don't. So we're just going to go like this for now. Okay, so 
Again, this is just a reference on how you could begin your painting. Since I didn't do a demonstration before you started your last painting, your um, achromatic painting, I thought this would be a good time to just show you how in real time I would start one of my paintings and um, to give you a sense of what I'm working with here. Um, my colors are actually a little bit different than yours. I, I haven't really purchased a Utrecht paint for myself very often, so my colors are from a different company. I'm noticing right now that my phone is slipping, so bear with me for a quick second here while I fix my setup. My apologies. I thought this would have already been stable enough, but turns out this is not quite secure. What is the problem here? Okay. This mobile arm isn't super, super reliable, but if I just tighten everything, I think it should stop moving on us. Um, but okay, I was just going to quickly show you. I'm using Rembrandt paint for my Burnt Sienna and my Ultramarine Blue. Um, so my hues might look a little different than yours, but you know the, uh, the effect of the temperature should still work the same. And then I'm using Gamblin's Titanium White. Um, and my brushes are long handle brushes with a few different um, uh, hair types. Like these are both synthetic soft um, flat brushes. I have three different hog hair bristle brushes here. They're different shapes. And actually these all, um, if that'll focus, let's see these, it's not going to focus. Um, I've had these for many years. So the bristles have really started to kind of wear out over time, but they're really good for sketching quickly and getting pretty loose, um, types of brushwork, which I like in the start of my painting. So I'm going to use those mostly for the demonstration right now. Um, and then, like I mentioned, I don't usually use mineral spirits very often. I have a little bit in here. I might dip into this once or twice um, at the start. Otherwise, if you see really thinned out paint, it's probably with this lavender spike oil that I've been using for the last couple of weeks, which is, um, as you can see, a natural solvent for oil painting that doesn't have carcinogenic fumes or turpentine or petroleum. Let me see if I can zoom back out. There we go. All right, so let's go ahead and just get started. Um, I, I'm not going to wear gloves because these pigments aren't very toxic, um, but I'm going to grab a little bit of my medium and just kind of saturate my palette a little bit so that my colors won't be too sticky. And the first thing that I want to do is just test the intensity of my colors. So I'm going to grab a little bit of white and I'm going to make two different piles for my burnt sienna and my ultramarine blue. And I just want to see how like powerful these colors are if they're not mixed with any other color other than white. I'm just going to tint this up just so I can get an idea of like what's my warmest kind of yellowy color that I can get. And the same thing for my cool side, like what's the purest cool that I can get at like a mid to high value, you know, and you could also keep going by mixing a little bit more white in. Um, and I'm going to leave this paint on the palette because I'd like to use it later on. Um, if I see these colors in my or these values, I should say, if I see these values in my reference. Um, and like I said, because I know where I want my warmest colors to go in the painting, I just want to get a, a sense of how intense my burnt sienna is going to be. So this is a pretty big difference, right? Like this has a very orangish kind of color to it. And you know, that's the, it's a direct compliment on the color wheel to your blue hues. Um, so they're going to work against each other, but also work with each other in, in the, in the sense that 
one is going to um, empower the other one, right? So the more blue that you have next to an orange, the more blue and the more orange those areas of the painting are going to feel because they're right next to each other. And we call that simultaneous contrast when painting. Um, the next thing I want to do is create like a pretty neutral grayish tone. And I'm going to take a pretty healthy amount of paint and bring that down here. Normally I would be painting on a flat surface, but I want you to see how I'm mixing things. So I have this at an upright angle on my easel. And the problem with this is that my colors might start to run down and not want to stick on the surface. So again, just kind of bear with me on this. So as you can hopefully see, this is a pretty brown tone. Now, if I were to grab some titanium white and mix into this, it probably would be pretty warm. It would be kind of a, a light brownish color and I want this to be more neutral. So that means I have to grab more ultramarine blue to mix into this. Now, ultramarine blue is a fairly transparent color when compared to other blues like phthalo blue, which actually I shouldn't say phthalo because that's also a pretty transparent color, but cobalt blue um, is, is another blue that is much more opaque and um, ultramarine blue nowadays is a pigment that is a little bit more affordable and um, they make hues of colors like cobalt hue, which just doesn't have the same tinting power that uh, normal cobalt does. So for our palette, I chose to go with ultramarine blue, but it's a very beautiful blue um, that is kind of on the, um, uh, I don't know if it's maybe all the way on the warmer side of blues. We'd really have to kind of start comparing all the different blues together to, to determine whether something is a warm blue or a cool blue. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and grab a little bit of white, and I'm gonna mix that into this so I can start to see the temperature a little bit better. Now, again, this is still pretty warm, so it's gonna take a little bit more ultramarine blue. One of the things that w you'll benefit from in watching me mix these colors is that you can already kind of tell, okay, he's having to use a lot of ultramarine blue to try to get to a neutral gray. And when you are mixing, I would then start with ultramarine blue and add a little bit of burnt sienna. Um, and that way you're not having to feed in so much ultramarine blue because as you've seen, I've only had to go in to burnt sienna once for this one mixture here. But okay, this is looking a lot more gray and a lot more cooler, a lot more bluish, I should say. Um, but overall, this has a, a fairly neutral kind of tone when you compare this hue over to our scale over here, right? Like if I just rub some of this paint on my palette knife and bring it over here, it starts to kind of blend in with some of these. Now, this could probably be a little bit warmer. I think maybe there's too much blue in this. So I'm going to grab a little bit of burnt sienna and just mix that into this entire pile. Because again, I just want to have a neutral on my palette doesn't really matter what the value is. I prefer to have a darker value for a neutral because then I can always tint it up with a little bit of white. And this is sort of like my base neutral now. Okay, perfect. Now I'm gonna grab a little bit of white and you hopefully are noticing that I'm also wiping off my palette knife when I'm reaching into these piles. And that's kind of keeping them from cross-contaminating and it's allowing me to have a much cleaner working area. Um, some artists will pre-mix a lot of their colors before they even start painting. I don't know if that's necessary. I like to sort of mix up a few different colors and then just start painting and then mix as I go. Um, but one thing you could do if you, if that sounds like a, a method you would like, is you could take some of your neutral once you have it. And I'm going to try to keep things pretty organized here. I'm gonna grab a little bit for both sides. And I'm gonna grab some burnt sienna. I'm gonna mix that right into here. And what I'm, get, what I'm trying to do now is lean my neutral into the warmer spectrum of temperature. Now I don't want this to go all the way up to like the intensity or the saturation of orange that burnt sienna has on its own. 
Um, I still want this to be kind of a warm neutral, so I'm just adding little bits of burnt sienna at a time. And already I can tell this is a pretty warm version, especially compared to this. Now, again, if you make, if you hold it next to these piles, which actually I'm realizing now I could probably just zoom us in here so you can get a better view of what I'm talking about. Um, if I take this and kind of put a little bit on my palette knife and hold it up next to my other area, there's definitely a, a difference in temperature there. Um, and I can do the same thing with ultramarine blue in this pile and bring it into more of a cool neutral tone. Now I'll show you here in a second what will happen when I tint this up. You can really tell the the difference in um, in temperature when the values aren't quite so deep. So let's grab a little bit of white, mix that over here. Yeah, this has like kind of a nice earthy sort of chocolatey brown color to it on that side. And then over here, we'll find a much cooler mixture, right? But again, th these colors are not quite as intense as the color straight out of the tube for ultramarine blue or burnt sienna, right? They're a little bit more kind of subdued and neutralized. And that's happening because we are mixing the complement with these two colors, right? So we're adding blue to our burnt sienna and we're adding burnt sienna to our blue. And that's helping to desaturate and cancel or contrast the temperature of the other, right? And now, so just in like the first 10 minutes of mixing colors, right? Now we already have five different realms of temperature and realms of intensity that we can play with while we're painting. And in the middle is where I have my neutral, right? So I wanted to show you that if you just take your burnt sienna and your ultramarine blue and you make a painting with those two and white and you never mix the two, your painting is going to have a very limited amount of space to create a sense of con contrast. And all of your contrast is going to be very intense because, actually I should rephrase that, it's not that your contrast will be intense, it's your your palette will be very intense because you're you're working with very saturated versions of these two colors. Now, when you start to mix into the more neutralized versions of those colors, you can open up your range of, of flexibility and then save these very saturated um, uh, mixes of your local color out of the tube for those key moments where you really want to push something forward or pull something back into space, right? By by using these temperatures that are really, really intense, that's gonna really pop the space. So my recommendation for this painting is to um, do a, you know, a few of these piles of mixes just so you can see what I'm talking about and you can see it firsthand. That'll, it'll also give you a sense of the tinting strength of your colors. Um, because every tube of paint is a little bit different between brands. Um, and while you work on this painting, then you'll be able to have a better idea of like, okay, how much blue should I put into this mix if I wanted to kind of find this brownish color um, versus this cool metal gray kind of color. Um, but all right, I think I've sort of said enough now. I'm gonna grab a little bit of odorless mineral spirits. I'm just gonna get my the tip of my brush um, kind of wet here, and I might dab a little bit off of my paper towel. Um, and I'm gonna grab some of this kind of grayish blue from over here because I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna start with the large shapes of the closet. Um, and actually, I think you can see up in this corner, there's a little bit of light that's running into the closet space because of a light that I have in the room that's up over this way. And that's different than my 
composition, which I kind of like. I think it's nice to have a warm shape in this cool space. And even on this little bar right here of the shelf, those will be warmer accents that I can have within this very dark blue space. And I think that's gonna make the painting a lot more interesting. So when you're looking at, at your view, think about what's, what's in shadow and what's being lit. Um, and again, this is gonna really change depending on what time of day you wanna start your painting. But be consistent. So if you start in the morning, always paint in the morning or um, always paint when there's natural light. So those are certain things that you'll have to kind of watch out for, for sure. Um, as you can see already, they, uh, these brushes have kind of a very wide, bristly nature to them. And it's hard to get a very clean line. And again, I like that when painting this way because I'm not going to be tied to any certain dimension of a shape. Now, and at least for me, I tend to get attached to some of my shapes, and I know other artists feel this way sometimes too, where once you draw a line and it's a really clean line, it can be hard to move that line and correct the line. So by keeping my edges and my dimensions like pretty rough, it doesn't feel like I, I'm locked in to any of these early decisions. All right, so from here, and again, I'm just kind of guessing at this point, like my, some of these lines are definitely gonna have to move and I know that and that's, that's okay. Um, okay, let's grab a little bit more of this. Cause again, what I'd like to do is start to really block in some of these big shapes right off the bat and just try to get some color down on my, on my panel here. I'm gonna need a little bit more mineral spirits. Um, you know, I've, I've said in the past that I, I really have taken mineral spirits out of my painting practice, which is true. Um, and I decided to, to use it a little bit here and there while teaching the class because you're using it in the classroom and um, I can just have my window cracked open while this painting um, oxidizes and that'll help alleviate some of the safety precautions I normally would be taking. Um, but again, I also kind of want to give you uh, some examples of ways that you can push, <clears throat> excuse me, push the paint around. Um, since I haven't really talked or demonstrated, talked about or demonstrated some of this stuff yet, so um, when I say to add a wash, sometimes you'll read this in my um, in my uh, instructions for assignments. I'll say you could start by adding a wash of paint. What I mean is thinning out your paint and literally painting it on the surface so that it has this like wide coverage, right? Like a, you saw how the paint was really dripping and sliding around. That's because it's so li like, li it's such a liquid um, kind of format with how much thinner or mineral spirits I, have, I had in there that the paint really is able to kind of glide across the surface and cover quite a bit of space. And um, the best part about this right now is that I'm able to really cancel out all of this white space on my palette or on my panel. Um, all right, I'm gonna need to grab a little bit more. But generally, I use mineral spirits like this in the first couple of um, stages of the painting, right? Just to really kind of break apart this white surface, just to get paint down to cover and get rid of this very bright, stark, white um, uh, surface, which is gonna kind of complicate a lot of our color mixes. So I highly, highly, highly recommend covering your panel as fast as possible because if you're trying to mix up certain values that you see, this white background is gonna kind of throw off some of the uh, future values that you're going to want to try to paint in. So now that I have this blue kind of blocked in here, I want to try to get some of this information that's to the left of the of the camera that you can't really see at the moment. Um, but right now, the lighting in this studio room is pretty warm. I have this very like yellowy kind of bulb, light bulb in this room, and. Um, it's making a lot of the paint on the walls very warm. So I 
without jumping immediately into my super duper warm area, I'm just going to grab some of this more neutral warm tones um, that I can go in here and start to fill in. And value wise, I mean, I can already kind of tell maybe this is too dark of a value, but one thing you'll notice is as your paint dries, it might change its appearance in value, especially value. Um, and with mineral spirits, I've noticed over the years this tends to happen. Like it, it'll look really, really dark when I lay the paint down, but then the next day I'll come into my studio and the paint looks a lot brighter. This could also obviously be depending on what time of day I'm working and how well lit the, the paint is or the panel is. It also depends on the light bulbs and the temperature of the light bulbs in the room. Like I've been saying, the light bulbs in my studio are very, very warm. So that's going to make my paintings seem fairly warm um, at, a, at a certain distance. but Or at least my subject matter is going to seem very warm. Okay, I'm going to step back for a second here because I want to make sure that my big shapes are not um, sort of tilting in the wrong direction or skewed to a point where they're not really believable anymore. Um, one of the things I kind of like about this angle that I'm choosing is that the, the you know edge of the baseboard here has a pretty sharp angle and I've kind of decided to tilt it so that my view of this closet isn't just straight up and down. I wanted to make the composition a little bit more interesting, so I've chosen to kind of find the composition and tilt it a little bit when I was looking at it with my viewfinder. Um, but again, this early stage with mineral spirits is really just to get rid of a lot of the white on the board, um, to really even out the surface. And once this is all covered, I'll probably stop using mineral spirits for the most part because I want to start building up the paint. And if I keep painting with such thin washes, um, it's just going to start to really overmix, and that can be a problem. Um, all right, I'm seeing a similar value kind of in this part of the baseboard too. So doorways and baseboards are interesting because the way that they're built... Oftentimes, if you can see them from like a three-quarter view, like, like I can right now, you see the front panel, right? Or like the, the, the plane that is part of the wall that I'm facing. But then because the door is open and I can see into the space, I also get to see a second plane that tilts back this way. And that's this darker plane right here. And that's what I'm trying to kind of pop in at the moment. Um, and since I already have this color mixed with the neutral that I like. I want to brighten it up a little bit with some titanium white. And my brush still has quite a bit of um, Gamsol in it. So if I just push down, it's pretty easy, excuse me, it's pretty easy to make the paint really f fill into the brush. Okay, and now again, I'm just loosely guessing, right? This is all sort of a guessing game to figure out, okay, if I pop this over here, how will I paint over this and fix this later? Now, one thing that you'll notice is I kind of work in these patches, right? I, I sort of come up with a really loose, simple um, framework for a lot of the big shapes, and then I fill in those big shapes with a very generalized um, color that I think is close in value, in hue, in temperature. Um, and then as I continue to develop the entire painting, it's pretty easy for me to correct those colors, right? But I, it's, I, I'm not able to, to de determine if something needs to be corrected until there's actually paint on the panel. So you have to really start painting to figure out what, you, what colors you need to fix. I've just decided I'm going to go ahead and put some gloves on because I am handling the mineral spirits now and holding the uh, paper towel, you know, it starts to, sometimes it can get kind of saturated with mineral spirits. And I just don't want that soaking into my skin, especially if I haven't used it in a long time. I think it might 
Um, it might, it just might bother my skin a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and put some gloves on. <clears throat> okay. Grab my brush that I was using here. Actually, I might switch over to my smaller bristle brush that I started with because my shapes are getting a little bit smaller now. Again, this is something else I want to mention. So, you know, you don't want to fill an entire um, huge ginormous shape with a brush like this, right? Because this will take you probably five times as long or 10 times as long to fill in as opposed to using a brush like this, right? If you just look at the amount of hairs that you have to work with and how much paint you can fit on a brush like this, when you have your big shapes, use your bigger brushes. That'll help you to one, get there faster and two, keep your painting a little bit looser, um, which uh, will in turn keep your painting from feeling as stiff, right? And the stiffer our painting designs feel, the less likely we are to make changes that are necessary for the paintings to develop. Okay, so that being said, I want to grab some of this and ease my way into some more saturation. I don't want to start off too saturated, so I'm just going to grab a little bit of my uh, mid-value neutral that I mixed up here, and I'm ending up with this color that's similar to this color over here. Um, it's very similar actually. So I'm going to go ahead and try to brighten it up because there is a value shift on this plane. I'm going to grab a little bit of my medium instead of mineral spirits and just see if I can start to fill this in. Now, one regret I do have already, um, for my painting pro process here is that I, this is also a little bit of my lavender oil. I'm going to try that for a few minutes here and just see, I've noticed just as a side note, I have noticed that lavender oil, well, one, it's 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 very expensive, and two, it dries much faster than mineral spirits does. So unfortunately, one of my favorite properties of Gamsol is that even though it thins out your paint and it'll speed up the drying time of your paint because it's so thin, it still stays, it still stays wet long enough for you to make adjustments, to, you know, kind of work back into the paint on the surface. Um, it's really easy to wipe out your brushes. All of those things are really handy to have while you're working. And this lavender oil doesn't really work the same way I've noticed. So I'm just saying this to anybody who, you know, in the future maybe has an opportunity to try out lavender oil. Now you just already know a little bit about it, which I think is helpful. So I'm just filling this in. Um, and I, I don't mind if this entire shape is the same color right now. Again, I'm, I'm, my goal right now is to try to cover up all of the white space and get rid of this white value. Um, and since paintings are made in layers, I'm not too worried about my shapes being exact. I'm not too worried about um, my edges looking good. You know, again, I think starting off loose and then tightening up is going to be a lot more um, forgiving, you know, or like cooperative, um, if you work this way. Okay. It's like, we're almost done. Actually, I might just go ahead and crack my window for a little while and get some fresh air in here. Um, okay. So now I just have this like shadow shape or this, um, I guess this, it's not a highlight, but this light that's being um, directed into the closet that I want to fill in. And again, my whole philosophy is start with a little bit and then add more. So I'm not going to start off too intense. Um, and I can fix this as I go. All right, but I just want to, it's almost like setting up a reminder like, hey, this is a very warm part of the painting or part of my view, I don't want to forget that this is on the warmer side. And I can just set that up with a neutral warm um, or like a more desaturated warm tone. So that looks pretty good. I'm just going to kind of make a few guesses as to where the that highlight of the shelf is going to go. Right. And now you can tell because this is all still really wet from the mineral spirits. I mean, even on the bottom here, I can see like a long drip. So I'm just going to kind of wipe that off to help that dry a little faster. 
Um, and I'm just looking for some of these big directional lines. All of this is going to have to be a lot darker as I keep working, which is okay. Um, but then I'll just kind of soften this up a little bit and just create more of a gradation from warm to cool because I can tell like the atmosphere of the light hitting those walls. There's a lot of reflected light. It's very dark in the video, but in person it's, it's a bit brighter than, than what we can see and what I can see on my phone. So I'm trying to match what I see in person as opposed to what you're seeing through my phone. Okay, and I just don't want to forget there's some like warm kind of lights hitting the wall in there. They must be bouncing off of some kind of material inside the room. But again, I can just kind of give the impression that those are there for now and then decide how to fix those as I continue. Um, you can see over here this darker line that's the shadow from the baseboard. Right now that's very blue. I'll probably end up going with more of a neutral color because that doesn't seem super blue right now. A lot of this space is gonna be fairly blue, especially up here along the top where we have some, I think we have like an air mattress and some extra boxes up on our shelf. Between a box and the air mattress bag, there's a really dark blue shape there. So I think what I'm gonna do is grab some ultramarine blue with my brush and some of this neutral, right? Because already our, the darkest value that you're gonna be able to work with is some sort of combination of blue and burnt sienna. Now, because ultramarine blue is very transparent, like I mentioned, um, you can't just use ultramarine blue. You're gonna have to use some burnt sienna to give it some opacity. And because I want the temperature here to be fairly cool, I'm, I'm just grabbing a little bit of my dark neutral and mixing it with ultramarine blue to give it that cooler, opaque um, color that I'm looking for. So now I wanna go in and just, because I'm using more paint as opposed to mineral spirits, this is gonna start to move around and flow really well because of the mineral spirit wash that's here but because there's more paint, it's gonna look a little bit more opaque, which is really important to, uh, to point out. Uh, okay, and I wanna give like a quick little line here for the edge of the box that's up there on the shelf. Um, and then there's kind of a line that goes around this bag. Um, and then it kind of brightens up just a little. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of white and mix right back into the same pile and I'm, I'm not being afraid to, ner to, I was gonna say nervous. I'm not being afraid to mix back into the neutral part of the mix here because I don't want this to be too blue yet. Again, if you haven't noticed, I'm trying to avoid going too saturated in any direction so far. And that's because I wanna save a lot of the power that's gonna come with the saturation. Okay, and now I wanna just fill this in. For the sake of the demonstration, I wanna work really quickly um, to get through a lot of this, just so you can see like how much you can put in with a very like limited amount of time. Like if you just make faster choices and start putting paint on, you'll get to conclusions a lot faster. And that's what painting is all about. It's all about just finding answers and forming different hypotheses about what if I push the color this way or what if I change the shape this way. Um, and a lot of these first couple paintings are about those choices that we make in our paintings and thinking about how we could have done things more effectively um, or even just analyzing to understand how our choices created a certain kind of effect in our paintings. Because the more that we understand, the more control we have to then communicate visually information that we want to communicate. All right, so as you can see, I'm just sort of like, my eye is following the line that's on top of this bag, which has our air mattress in it. And I want to make sure that I'm looking for those darkest areas. And I'm just being kind of loose with how things are falling down um, in terms of shadow that are, shadows that are getting brighter. So, up on the top of the shelf up here, a lot of the values 
are really dark. Like it's probably the darkest area of my view, unless I end up sneaking in some of my black case that's down here, kind of in this area of the wall. So, um, give me one second real quick. I just have to move some things around. So, um, so yeah, I'm just looking at, okay, the dark values are up on top of the shelf. Um, there's a line down here. I don't want to forget about, it's, there's part of a baseboard that's inside the closet. And, you know, the architecture of this corner and this like interior space of the closet, there's a lot of hard edges and there's a lot of perspective happening. And I think it's okay not to really draw everything out and then fill in all of those lines. I think, especially for this painting, which is all about temperature, just start painting. You know, don't worry about having everything sketched out right away before you start applying paint onto your surface. You know, work looser, get more and more like tight as you continue the painting. Um, okay, so then I want to go under the bag here and there's actually like a, a blanket or something up on the shelf that kind of drips over this way. And I'm just gonna go ahead and fill this all in for right now. And I can go in and carve, carve out some shadows and bring in some, you know, temperature shifts or highlights if I have to. Um, so now I want to try to get a closer idea of the values that are in this lower part of the shelf because this is very bright, right? It's probably a similar value as the yellowy kind of tan color up here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and mix up a neutral, cool, that's a little bit brighter than what I've been painting. So I'm just going to grab a little bit of my neutral and just mix it right into this bluish um, bluish gray that I was just using up on top, but it's a lot brighter now. And if I just kind of lay this in, yeah, this is going to work really well. So now this has a little bit more of a warm uh, temperature to it compared to this, right? If you look at here and then jump over here, you can tell this is much cooler, even though they're both pretty neutral compared to the orange and the blue here. And when we talk about temperature, this is exactly how I want us to think about it, right? I want us to think of even neutral colors as having temperature because we're not working with just white and black anymore. We are still working with some chroma in burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. Um, but the beautiful thing with the two of those is that they're, they're the way that they cancel one another out, they give you this, this beautiful range of, of desaturation to play with. And, you know, the subtlety of temperature now can be really at the forefront of your painting. Um, and this is the way that you're going to get there is by mixing those two colors together in different amounts and starting to become more aware of, of this, you know, the power in very small shifts of, of mixes. All right. So now the corner of the, sh of the closet has, is like right here in my painting. Um, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but the line for that corner is right here. And this was that baseboard shadow that I was talking about that I kind of have put in over here. And then there's another baseboard shadow that runs along here, but that kind of seeps into shadow on that side. So I'm just going to keep the same gray that I've been using. And I'm going to just draw a line across this way. Even if it's a really big line, later on I can go through and I can adjust that if I want to. Now, this wall on the right is a little bit lighter than this wall here. This is this might actually be too light for um, the space inside the closet still, but that's okay. I'll, I'll just paint over that later. Right now what I want to do is cover this, this light blue because that's not really helping me. So I'm going to grab some titanium white and... 
just keep mixing in that same area that I was mixing before. And what's going to happen is the residue of this color that I was just using is still a little bit on the palette, but it's also in the brush um, because I'm not really wiping my brush off. I'm kind of keeping the same, you know, kind of mixes in, in my two brushes I've used so far. And what that does is create a harmony within the entire painting. And harmony is really important. I think the more we add in terms of our ingredients and think of our colors as our ingredients or our color palette as our ingredients list. So our ingredients are titanium white, burnt sienna, and ultramarine blue, right? Now, if I were to go ahead and grab a cadmium yellow and all of a sudden bring that into this palette, now that's going to open up a whole nother set of mixing possibilities that just builds out the possible colors that I have access to, right? Now when you now when you have a palette that has 10 colors, imagine how big all of your options become. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because sometimes you can only get a certain color if you put that color in your palette, right? I can't mix a yellow out of this. This is the closest thing I can mix to a yellow, and that's not very yellow. It's more of like a kind of light macaroni and cheese color. It's more of an orange. And you know, I can't mix a very good green. I could mix, you know, this is the closest I'm going to get to mixing a green is somewhere between here. And that's okay, you know, if you can't do that for certain paintings. Now, the reason we're doing this very, very limited palette painting is because I want you to encounter, this is kind of going back to what I just said a few minutes ago, I want you to encounter the power of subtlety between two colors, especially if they're complementary colors, because the impact that they have on each other opens up this really, really interesting range of neutral colors that still have a lot of very, very specific properties in terms of temperature. So, okay, as we can see, I've got everything pretty much filled in to like a very far away place from white. Now I've been, I started this stream about 47, a little over 47 minutes ago. So it took me, you know, let's take five minutes away from that. So closer to 40 minutes to get to this point because I was moving the camera and doing other stuff. But anyway, at 40 minutes, this is really, really good progress because I already have my entire composition laid out. I know where my big shapes are going to be. I'm starting to get a value structure that's making more sense. And I'm getting a temperature structure that makes sense to me as well. Now, that's really the foundation that you should be striving for within the first hour of your painting process or by the end of the first hour of your painting practice process. I keep interchanging those words. But anyways, um, so I feel really good about this progress right now. I'm going to keep working for another half an hour and see where I'm at. Um, but just to take a quick break, like talking about temperature, I mean, even here, right, just if we just look at this one rectangle, and I asked you to point to two orange lines, I think everybody could pretty quickly find one here and one here. And now the word orange is often, you know, when someone says the word orange without looking at this painting, you'd probably think of a color like this, right? And now this color and this color are two very different colors, but they both appear to be orange when placed against a certain other color, right? Now, because this is very gray and very kind of cool, it's going to make this seem more warm. Um, the same thing is happening all throughout the rest of the, of the painting, like this tone here seems a lot warmer because of this blue line that I have here. Um, and when we talk about temperature, this is the kind of stuff that we should be thinking about, right? It's like, how do I make something seem warmer if I have a very limited number of options, right? Like if like how, like this, if this color was on your palette, right? Just this hue as its own color. And I said, make that look orange. The fastest way to make that happen is to place it against something that is very blue and cool. Um, because that's going to contrast with the warmer colors that are in here. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to emphasize that as being even warmer or even more orange. All right, let's keep moving. I'm going to go ahead and grab some of this darker neutral here. And I want to fill in this shape up here. 
And for the most part, it has a fairly neutral temperature along the top. So I'm just gonna start filling in this shape again, kind of loosely. I want this to end up blending together. So in the future, I'm gonna go back and really be more um, intentional about my edges. But for right now, this is just about putting down a color that represents the hue and the value that I kind of want this to, to work around. Um, and then it warms up just a little bit on the bottom and it lightens because some of the light is bouncing off the wall and reflecting onto the bottom of this bag. So I just want to add in like a little warm strip of paint just along the bottom there. And eventually that's going to end up looking like it's reflecting some of this orange light over here, but that'll be fixed way down the line of this painting. Um, now I want to go in and kind of find a value that's similar to this. Now it's similar to the bag, but it's a little bit darker and a little bit warmer. So I'm just going to drag some of this neutral tone up and mix in some burnt sienna. Now if this is too warm, what I'll, what I would do or what I'm going to do is add in a little bit of ultramarine blue. Um, but again, that's going to make this darker. So now that middle brownish color is going to be a darker brownish bluish color. And if that's too dark, you just have to grab some titanium white and lighten it back up. So this is one of the things with mixing your colors that you'll have to keep focusing on and keep being aware of. See, already I can tell that's way too warm. Uh, it stands out way too much. And the problem with that is then it looks like there's a lot of light that's hitting this object, when in reality, there isn't very much light hitting that object. So I'm gonna add a lot more blue and just paint right over it so that they kind of mix together. Um, and the paint is very thin still. Even though I'm not using mineral spirits, there's still some on the surface of the panel. And I'm using uh, some of my medium here and there. So I'm much happier with that. That blends in a little bit more but it still stands out against the more bluish color that's uh, on the higher part of the wall in this space. Okay, now I want to kind of work back into the warmer neutrals to pop in some of these tones here. They're a lot darker than the highlights that are over in this area, but they're still pretty warm. So I'm trying to describe that very loosely. And again, this is also something I'm doing to get rid of the lighter, the much lighter values that I have here in this part, these parts of the painting. Okay, so this feels pretty good. I feel like I have a really nice structure so far. I'm gonna switch brushes now and start working with some of my softer, flatter brushes. These will give me much sharper shapes and sharper edges because I want to start to really get in here and start thinking more about measurements and try to get things more proportionally correct. Um, and maybe I'll start with my palette knife again here to mix up something a little bit more substantial for my brush. So I'm going to grab some ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna. And I want this to be mostly cool because I want to go back up in here again and really try to get the, the value and the temperature right this time. Um, because this was mostly just to get me away from the white surface of the panel, but to stay within the temperature that I liked. So this is probably actually the darkest value that I can get out of this palette um, is what I'm mixing right now. So if you have any areas of your, of your space, <clears throat> excuse me, your space that appear to be black, this is probably gonna have to be the value and the color that you're gonna have to mix, which is this really, really dark gray. Um, but that's as dark as these two colors are gonna to wanna to go. Um, I'm gonna grab just a tiny little bit of medium. I don't want too much because I, I want this paint to stick on the surface. And if you have too much medium or mineral spirits in the paint, it's not gonna to want to, to lay on top of the, the first layer that has a lot of mineral spirits in it. So kind of like what happened here, I wanna repeat that process. So this is mostly paint right now. And I want to go in here. And I'm just looking now at the dimensions of 
this plane that, that, that is on this box that I can see up on the shelf. And now you can notice too that the surface of the painting is going to look a lot more opaque, right? Because the, the bristle brushes are very like stiff and they're very distinct um, hairs on those brushes. So when you paint your, your panel, you're leaving all these little streaks and marks, which sometimes is a really beautiful effect. And I kind of like to leave that in some of my paintings because it adds some variety in the in this texture and surface of the painting, but um, you'll notice the difference when using softer brushes because they're much they're much tighter together. There's more hairs and they're much thinner, so the lines that they leave are a lot less noticeable, um, and they can be really good brushes for doing more detailed work or cleaner types of lines. So now I'm just looking for some really dark areas of the of my reference up there. And I'm still trying to be kind of loose, you know, I'm not, I'm standing almost at arm's length away from the easel behind my phone, so I'm not, you know, blocking the view at all. Now I'm trying to figure out the more, like, accurate dimensions of the box that are up here. There's a little bit more space than I had previously thought between the, this edge of the box and, like, this edge of the door frame there. I'm going to grab a little bit of titanium white and I'm just going to mix that in with my brush because I want to see the difference in value. If you notice, it's kind of hard to tell, but this was the original pile and now this is the same pile with just a tiny bit of white. The value shift is very noticeable still. It's, you know, it's subtle, but they're not the same color and I want that because when I'm looking at my source, my eyes are looking for where the dark shadow becomes a little bit brighter um, and how that describes this interior space. Now, I'm already thinking ahead a little bit for when this painting starts to dry over the weekend. I'll probably, like once this area starts to dry out, I'll probably go back with more ultramarine blue and paint over this a little bit. And again, because I said ultramarine blue is transparent, if I paint over this, some of this value will still show through if I don't use too much ultramarine blue. And that'll really start to push the, that shadow back in space even more because it's it's blue, but it's, it's, it's kind of a neutral blue right now. And I'd like to add some more chroma and saturation later on in the, in the painting process. So... Right now, I'm just kind of filling in these big shapes again, trying to get the value and the temperature that I like because this has a very deep value compared to the door frame. I'm noticing, though, that there's also this, I don't want to forget, there's this little shadow that's popping in from the door frame here, and it's a really, it's a really nice shape. So I'm just going to kind of carry this same value into this part of the, the frame. And it's there's definitely a... a, a a change in the uh, temperature there, but I'll I'll just paint over that later. And then I'm just also kind of making some notes of some of the line work and the frame of the door. You know, we call these types of choices, these little reminders, notations. When we're drawing or when we're painting, it's sort of like helping out our future selves, right? It's like, hey, don't forget to look over here and add in this information because that's going to really help create the illusion of dimension or volume in this part of the reference. So I'm going to grab a little bit of this blue, this light blue, and let's just go ahead and kind of do a quick mark there as that shadow kind of starts to lighten up over there. I also need to start cleaning up some of these lines at the lower part of the shelf. Um, you know, overall the painting is pretty abstract, right? It's it's a, it's a lot of loose edges. Um, it's a very limited amount of color. That doesn't mean it's abstract, but you know, there's it's just not very descript yet. And it's going to get there, but it has to happen in layers, and I have to make sure I'm getting some of these early things down first that I can then build upon, right? This is just my foundation for the painting. 
And some of this, some of these, you know, surface areas might remain until the very end of the painting. I might like them and choose to leave them in. And I kind of like the sketchy look of paintings sometimes. So there's a pretty good chance that'll happen. But, um, you know, regardless, it's very, very important to give yourself the best chance to make a painting that feels believable by paying attention to your foundation and these early, early choices, these big shapes, you know, thinking about proportion, thinking about temperature and value. Those are all the things that are going to help, you know, you make your painting seem more realistic. Okay, I'm just going to drag this across here because the shadow up here kind of comes and goes, like these shapes of of light kind of come and go into this shadow. Um, and it's not black, right? Like this shadow on top of the wall, it's not black, but it's not warm and it's not bright. So it's it's like what's left, okay? That means it's cool and it's dark or it's close to dark. So, you know, even thinking that way might be helpful in determining what kind of color you need to put in in certain places. I'm just adding in a darker neutral blue. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm going to grab a little bit of this orange over here, mix that off to the side. The other thing you'll notice about the way that I like to set up my palette and mix my colors is I kind of mix in piles, right? And the nice thing about this is you, you have this history of colors you've already mixed. So if you need something, it's still kind of there. Now, designating one part of your palette as like the you know as the the place where you're going to do the majority of your mixing i think is good because that way you have these references along the perimeter um, and you can grab and pull them into this middle mixing area but even in the middle mixing area which is kind of a mouthful to say i think it helps if you kind of work on the periphery of these different piles that way you still have those little moments from your process to go back to or to pull from and instead of just like mixing in the same area over and over and over and over and over you know if you don't periodically use up all the paint or wipe it off you're going to keep mixing those past colors into whatever you're trying to get to therefore just complicating the whole process more than it needs to be okay now i need to start to figure out i think for right now i'm just going to go ahead and fill this all in so i had this starting to like you know shape out with the the direction of the light up in this this area over here but i kind of feel like i'm losing that a little bit i don't want to get caught up in just finicking with that over and over and over so i'm just going to paint over it and get my dark value in first and then i can paint on top of it with the lighter values all right and then here we gotta start kind of working back into these two different planes of the wall. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but at the right underneath this shadow from the baseboard, the wall is a little bit brighter than it is like all the way down here. And the same thing happens like up the corner into this little corner of the back wall, right? There's like a little highlight area there. So I got to remember to kind of keep those, you know, or just be sensitive to those as I'm filling in this space. And again, all of this is going to probably get painted over again. You know, it's definitely possible. Um, I'm not in love with what I'm painting right now, so I definitely can tell you right now it's, it's probably going to get painted over. But at least we're getting, we're getting closer, right? It's starting to feel like this area of the painting is different. It's a different space than the rest of the frame and the wall. And that's what we want, right? We want to try to use temperature to create a difference in space. We want something to feel closer. We want something else to feel farther away. That's, that's the whole premise of this assignment. Um, okay, might as well just bring this all the way down for right now. I need to mix up some more paint. I'm not using enough paint. So I'm just, what I'm doing essentially is just dragging a very dry brush around and not adding paint on the surface. So if you feel like that's happening, it probably means you just need to be using more paint. Now the problem I have is I have to try to remember what I kind of mixed to get to that point. 
And this is exactly why using a very limited palette is helpful for assignments like this, because the more color options you have, the harder it is to remember how you got to a certain mixture on your palette. So this makes it really simple. It's like you have one warm, one cool, and white to tint up. So shouldn't take very long to get back to a color that makes sense. I'm gonna, I ended up opting for a very neutral gray um, for this inside wall, and that's kind of because I can't tell. To be totally honest, I can't tell if that wall, if this wall is warm or cool. So instead, I'm just gonna start with a very neutral gray, and then as I continue to observe, I can paint over this and add in more subtle variations of temperature um, that'll add, I think, more atmosphere too. It'll give the wall a, more of a presence if I can start to play with temperature later on. Uh, again, I just wanna get paint on here, right? I just wanna fill this up and I don't want this to look transparent, right? Like this still has a very transparent look to it. So if we're talking about value and properties of color, you have to really put paint down to be able to make those distinctions. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. Now, there's still this, this. it's actually a guitar case in there. It's like a canvas guitar case. So I need to figure out how I wanna put that in, but maybe I'll wait, cause I think it comes up to about here, this area here. So I'm gonna pause there. I'm gonna grab this light warm, this light uh, burnt sienna, mix it into the mixture I just had because I wanna, again, create a difference in plane. So I can't use the same color, even though both these walls are very similar. We have to create a sense of shift, right? That the, that the wall is now some, I did, now we are looking at a different wall. So it, it has different properties than the other wall. Now, if there was less light in the, in the closet, I probably would just fill the entire, this whole area with the same color but there's actually quite a bit of variation. The longer I look, the more I start to notice and the more I start to realize, oh crap, I have to make those adjustments. And if I want this to look like what I'm looking at, I have to be true to, to what I see, you know? And that's, that's the whole point of these assignments, these first couple assignments is to, to challenge ourselves to really paint what we see. Not what we want to see or not what we wish we had in front of us, but to really just accurately try our best to capture the color properties of, of our reference. And painting from life is one of the fastest and one of the most reliable ways to learn how to do that. Okay, got this over here. I'm just gonna try to fill this in. See, so yeah, I need more paint now. Okay, grab a little bit of white. Ultramarine blue. Honestly, it wouldn't hurt to have a pretty good pile of a neutral gray on your palette, especially if it was kind of a darker one, just consistently there to use. All right, luckily for me, the back wall in this room is not very dark, so this value is gonna be pretty close. So I'm gonna use this paint to finish off this area down here. I'm just kind of loosely popping this in. You know, with these flat synthetic brushes, they don't leave very thick brush strokes. And that's good because if you're painting with very thick brush strokes, that means your paint is gonna stay wet for a lot longer. And then that means you might run into some problems if you realize you have to make corrections. So I recommend painting with very thin amounts of paint when you're starting off with your painting and gradually add more and more paint uh, to your mixes. And like, these are what I mean by your mixes, piles of paint on your palette. So what I wanna do is just cover most of this part of the closet and just give myself a little bit of a place marker for where I saw those um, brief 
like subtle shifts in value and temperature from light that's bouncing off the wall there. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Now, what I, what I would do in a moment like this is keep this pile over here, grab a little bit of burnt sienna, and again, working on the periphery of that initial pile, I'm just grabbing a little bit of white and a little bit of burnt sienna because I want this to seem warmer, right, and a, and a little bit brighter. And just by mixing it on my palette, you can start to see how these two colors are going to interact. This is essentially what's going to happen if I put this color down here. This is the relationship they're going to have. Now, if I look at my reference on the wall, it's still a little bit warmer and a little bit brighter. So I have to keep adding burnt sienna and titanium white. I'm getting a little bit uh, lazy with my, my piles of my initial colors some people call this the uh like these colors they call them your mother colors or your like your parent colors because those are the three colors that you then mix all of the rest of your colors from so we can call them parent colors too from now on but i'm going to paint right over this and just fill that space and now like look what i just did right i basically i kept that same Part of the painting i just made it a little bit darker compared to here right this is what it used to be so now it's a little bit darker and a little bit warmer maybe you could say um and that's actually a lot more accurate to what i see in front of me so i'm just going to kind of fill this whole thing and i want to i want to cover this early part of the painting i don't want that to be shown because the wall is not that bright See, now it really, this whole area sings a lot better, right? It has a much more continuous, harmonious relationship. And that's what you want in your painting. Now, if, if you leave some of these early choices and you never correct them, the painting is going to have moments of disconnect. And that could be problematic when we view it at the very end of your, your process. And, you know, try not to get in the habit of... of leaving something unfinished you know there's definitely a time and a place to to use this aesthetic of the unfinished painting but when we're learning about color this is not the time to to leave parts of your painting unfinished okay so now that i have this space pretty well filled in i think i might just go in real quick and mix up a dark neutral value again this is going to be for my guitar case that i mentioned that's the lower left part of the inside of the closet there and again i'm not too worried about temperature in some of these areas because i can always go back over them and add in a little bit more burnt sienna or ultramarine blue um you know again it's this is all about speed so you want to get to these areas and these moments of your process as fast as possible um, because again the more paint you have here the more we can actually judge the relationships of the of the areas of the painting based on color based on value okay so this is a very weird shape actually this guitar case it's sort of like folded over on itself and I can tell I'm going to have to paint over this again because this gray color here is mixing with my dark. You know, if you see it, see how dark this is here versus how light it is here. It's the same color on my brush, but what's happening is it's mixing with this lighter gray on the background. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, I'm going to have to definitely paint over this later but at least it's closer to the end result. And that's another way that we should be approaching our paintings, right? It's not like I have to get it right this first time and I have to finish the painting as fast as possible. No, I think instead it's about learning as you go and making choices and learning from your choices, right? Because a painting like this, you know, there's so many different ways that I could have made this painting for this class, for this assignment. Um, I could have picked a different view. I could have kept the same perspective oops, and cropped it a different way. I could have chosen to reverse 
some of the color choices or some of the value choices could have been different. I could have decided, you know what, I want to, I want to try to, um, you know, change up the value scale and maybe only work on the higher end of the value scale or, or the lower end. Um, but instead, you know, we're looking at a painting that has these choices in it and as I continue to paint, I'll, I'll refine those choices and take what I can learn and keep going. So it just takes time. And that's one of the things that is great about painting is it's a medium that is very independent and it, and it kind of benefits people who are, you know, okay with working independently, unlike other medium where you, or other mediums where you need a lot of facilities or you need um, a community of people. Painting is something you can do just when you have the materials and you have the time. And therefore, you have a lot of opportunities to learn. All right, I'm trying to get some of the handle on the guitar case in here. Just again, this is like a little notation. I, I'm probably going to have to fix this in the future, but at least I'm not forgetting about it right now because this is the other problem. Sometimes when we are making our paintings, we know what we have to do, but then we get distracted and start working somewhere else and we never come back and, and, and make those corrections that we said we were going to make. And I think we need to be good about forming those habits of like, okay, I, I'm thinking about this right now. At least I have it there. At least I didn't totally forget. Because even if it's not perfect, at least it's there's something there, right? That's the other problem that can happen. It's is thinking like, oh, well, I'll just come back to it. And if you don't come back to it, then this whole space is blank. And, you know, not only is it inaccurate, but it's also not as interesting. I think by adding some of this information on the lower side of the space, it just, it creates another focal point or like another pathway for our eyes to move and process more information. I also really like just the way that the shape is being um, uh, fractured, right? Or, or, or um, kind of broken apart. And, you know, originally this was just two very narrow vertical rectangles. And that's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's more interesting than one rectangle, but it's also not very interesting. So I think by adding stuff on the bottom here, or even adding in like these little shapes here, it just makes the whole scene a lot more complex and then therefore a lot more engaging and visually um, appealing. Okay, so that feels pretty good there. Now, let's see, I want to try to fill in part of the door frame and get some of this stuff figured out before I start to, to call it a day on this, on this beginning. Um, demonstration. I think regardless of when I stop today, I'm definitely going to share the progress uh, at the start of class on Tuesday. Um, and then I can kind of talk about some of the things I've learned in making this painting so far, some tips that I would recommend. Hopefully everybody takes the hour and possibly hour and a half to watch this entire demonstration because you know, there's a lot of things I covered that I don't get the time to talk about in class. So over the weekend, I'm hoping everyone is scheduling out some time to, to check this out. Okay, so already I can tell that that this shape here is too dark. And, you know, it was kind of that like, we could say that was a mistake, right? And that's okay. I can paint over it. I can wipe it away. I can fix it. It's not a big deal but at least I made a choice and now I've learned something by that. And that's what I want us to do as we work, right? And the, again, this is why I stress the speed or the frequency of brush strokes, right? Like how, and within one minute of time, how many choices are you making on the painting? And the people that make the most choices are generally the people that learn the fastest and, and then therefore improve the fastest, um, you know? If we treat all of these paintings as exercises or as opportunities to learn, I think the pressure to make them amazing or to make them perfect 
will float away, right? And that's what I think we should keep talking about as we continue our, our paintings in the class is to avoid perfection and instead strive for education, right? And the way that we're going to learn is by making mistakes and by making choices, you know, and the best part about making choices and making mistakes is that you make enough of both and eventually you find the answers and you find what works and you begin to become acquainted with a process that um, is really hard to do. And there's a lot to be said about that. Even if you don't pick up a paintbrush again after this course, you've learned a process that is cognitive, right? That's It's like happening in our brains. All of these different parts of our brains are coming together to find solutions to, to various visual problems or even physical problems, right? Because with mixing paint together, that's a very physical act that we're doing and we're learning how to be sensitive, right? And I think that's a really important skill when you're an artist or even just as a person is to also be forgiving to when you make a mistake and to uh, give yourself the credit that you're trying your best and you know you're doing something that is as can be very difficult sometimes and that's okay but that's pretty much the end of my pep talk for right now i want to get back into talking about my painting before i wrap this up i think i'll st- I'll end the stream at 90 minutes. I'll try to keep it at a clean hour and a half. Um, I'm really, really happy with how much progress I've made so far. Um, I don't expect anybody to get this far on their paintings with an hour and a half. I obviously have put a lot more time into um, painting, and I think this is where experience is something to be taken into account. So... um, you know, within two hours or two and a half hours, if you get to a point like this, then I think you're in really good shape. And, you know, what I would start to do after this and what I'll probably do during our class demonstration is start talking more about intensity of color, right? Because again, this is all pretty neutral compared to those first two mixes that we made. Like this blue seems like a sky blue compared to this. And... You know, I want to I want to utilize the um, intensity that comes with the saturation of these two colors, um, and I'll do that once you know the neutrals are kind of set in and the values are really figured out. So um, it just takes time, and that's okay. Grab a little bit of white. I don't want to forget about this highlight here that comes in. Um, the one issue that I am going to face, however, is my lighting will will definitely be different if I paint during class because I didn't start this painting until like 8.30 uh, Thursday night. And, um, you know, the shadows might be different than how they look right now. Um, and I'm a little bit concerned about that if I do a demonstration during class because... Yeah, I'd, I'd rather not go through and just move everything around because it looks different, right? And I don't want anyone else to have to do that on their paintings. So that's what I mean when I say just be mindful of what time you're starting and what day, like what hours of the day you're working. Make sure that there are hours that you can, or there are lighting conditions at least that you can duplicate or replicate. All right, you can see I'm kind of starting to get into a little bit more intensity here. Um, Let's see, this goes to about there. Now, instead of just taking one kind of scoop of the paint and mixing it across, I know that if I do that, the paint is going to slowly get more and more neutral or like more and more dead. And I'd like to keep the intensity for as much as possible. Um, And therefore, I just keep grabbing more paint and... Um, trying to layer on top of this this more neutral part of the painting. Okay, hopefully, you know, looking at this, you're able to at least get a sense of the space that I'm talking about and that I'm looking at um, that makes sense to you. Um, Maybe before I 
start to clean up here, I should pop in these darker, warmer um, parts of the painting. Um, something I haven't talked about yet is another tool that is very handy, and that's any kind of like durable stick or, um, you know, pipe or broomstick, you know, anything, anything that's kind of durable and like this length can be a very handy tool um, that can, can be used as what we call a mall stick, which is spelled M-A-H-L. And it's essentially just a, like a stick or a rod that you lean against your can your easel to hold your painting hand. Um, that way you can get really careful line work without having to actually put your hand on your wet painting. Um, so if you find any like scrap wood in the studio or um, you know you end up at a hardware store, you can pick up these you know pieces of wood for a couple bucks and they'll last a really long time. Some artists, fashion like a little hook with a wire. Um, I sometimes I'll just put one of these clips on the end. Um, one of these one of these kinds of clips on the end and then that can this part up here, the little like eye hole part can hook on my on my board up here. But for right now it's fine if I just I'm using it as a normal stick. But um, I'm grabbing it and I'm talking about it because I'm about to put in a fairly um, steady line on this edge of the baseboard over here. And I don't want to do that freehand. I'd like this to be pretty, pretty straight all the way down. Um, and instead of going this way, sometimes I like to make my linear lines with little short horizontal brush strokes. And part of that is because I feel like the paint, it's easier to control how much paint I'm actually putting on the surface. And then part of that is also because I like the um, kind of variation that you get with the width. Um, I think sometimes if we have a very straight line, it ends up looking more Ill, like Ill, kind of like illustrative or cartoony. Um, and shadows are rarely perfect, you know, perfect, straight, consistent shapes and um, you know, the longer you look at things from life, the more you're going to start to notice that there's a lot more of an organic sense to our objects, uh, different objects that we're looking at, um, and trying to paint from life. And the way that we handle our edges is going to help create a scene or an image that, um, kind of, um, presents that idea of organic kind of shapes and edges. So I kind of tend to loosen up a little bit with some of the shadows. Um, when I go to paint this lighter tone of the baseboard or like the um, closet board here, I'm also realizing real quick that I went a little too far to the left. So I'm gonna bring this in a little bit more and I can just clean that up and paint over it later. But anyway, I think it's looking pretty good. Still not quite enough. It has a weird, you can see it, right? Like this line, it makes sense all the way until about here, all right? And then it starts to curve in a very roundish way that's not very believable. So I think just to skip ahead a little bit, I think I'm gonna have to just drag my brush down. Um, part of the problem I'm having, and I don't want to make this sound like an excuse, but part of the problem is definitely that my phone is standing in a spot or is positioned in a spot where I would probably be standing and I would have noticed this a lot earlier. So hopefully while you're working, you know, you can check those angles and make sure that they make sense. The perspective makes sense. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is just with that first big bristle brush, I'm just gonna kinda of smear the wider part out and blend it into the background a little bit more. That way it's not as distracting. You can still see it, but it's not quite as prominent, which is good. So okay, that wraps up the demo for right now. Um, go ahead and, and try out some of these mixing techniques that I talked about. 
don't forget, if you haven't started yet, you, you have to do thumbnail sketches. You have to, have to, have to. And the reason I require thumbnail sketches is because so often do we forget about composition and the act of creating a design. And the problem with painting is if you start painting and you don't think about the design, you don't think about how do I make this seem really visually engaging, visually interesting, visually surprising, is that you start painting and you get committed to whatever you start painting. And then before you, or once you realize that the design is maybe not very substantial or not very dynamic, you've already put all this effort into a painting that you don't want to change. And then you, you end up turning in a painting that is your first attempt, it's your first idea, and generally first ideas are not our best ideas. So do at least three thumbnail sketches. Um, I like to cut one out after, uh, I, I already photographed them as a whole page. And once you do that, you can just cut yours out and tape it up by your painting. That way you can use it as a reference to just remember some of the big ideas that you liked about the, uh, the, the view and the design to begin with. So I'll give you a quick, oops, I'll give you a quick uh, look up close at the painting so you can get an idea of the texture and the surface. Um, you know, I apologize if YouTube isn't the clearest platform in terms of definition and clarity, but at least it's something and at least it's a tool that's available to everybody no matter where you are. So that pretty much wraps things up for me tonight. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this project and, uh, you know, developing my painting alongside everybody else. So I'll see you on Tuesday and have a great weekend. Um, let me know if you have any questions. All right, goodbye.